welcome to the 2021 Leadership Summit of the um, Alumni Society. I'm Ruben Navarrete, and I'm joined today by uh, Marty Chavez. First, by way of my background, I'm a contributor to Hispanic Executive Magazine, a syndicated columnist with the Washington Post Writers Group, and host of the podcast Ruben in the Center. Marty Chavez has a resume and a bio that puts mine to shame. We're going to give you the short version of this. Marty Chavez, PhD, is widely renowned as a trailblazer and leader who turned a Wall Street trading business into a software business, revolutionizing the way that capital moves and works. Since January 2021, he serves as senior advisor to Six Street Partners, where he works on research and development, diversity, equity, and inclusion, the sourcing engine, and the more than capital business, driving deeper engagement with the portfolio companies. Before joining Six Street, Marty served in a variety of senior roles at Goldman Sachs, including chief information officer, where he oversaw the firm's 9,000 engineers, chief financial officer, and global co-head of the firm's securities, now global markets division. Marty was also a partner and member of the Goldman Sachs Management Committee. Uh, Marty holds a AB, BA from uh, a magnum cum laude from Harvard, which I understand is a pretty good school, uh, in biochemical sciences, an SM in computer science from Harvard as well, a PhD in Stanford in medical information sciences, specializing in a bunch of words I can't pronounce and don't understand. Marty Chavez, so good to be with you. Thank you for the time. I look forward to this conversation. It's a pleasure, Ruben. Thank you for inviting me. So you've gone to places where relatively few Hispanics have gone before, Harvard, Stanford, Silicon Valley, uh, Goldman Sachs. I know people always ask you what you did right to get to all these places. I'd like to flip that question on its head, though, and ask it this way. What do you think most Hispanics don't get about getting to these places, about how to get to these places? What's holding us back? Are the forces internal, uh, internal, external, or both? And most importantly, how do we overcome them? So Ruben, the forces are both internal and external. As with almost everything, right? If you ask me the nature versus nurture question, I'd say the answer is a combination of the two. And and oh, look, the, the the oppression, the the racism, are, have been terrible. Are terrible. Systematic. Everywhere you look, uh, I've experienced it. You've experienced it. We all have, and and and, and probably. I, I won't speak for your experience, but I know my experience is a, is a, is a tiny version of what so many others uh, experience. And at the same time, I'll go with uh, the, the view here. I'm, I'm narrating the view of one of the most powerful people in my life, as with many of us, it's my mom. And, and I'll, I'll mention a story that really, really stuck with me. So. So my mom grew up in the, in the barrio and very much in, in, enmeshed in, uh, in, in that world. And my, my family was part of that world as well in terms of speaking. I don't know if anyone even uses the term pachuco anymore uh, or cholo. Um, but, uh, but anything that sounded like that, my, my mom was always on the lookout for that. And, and so I remember once, um, well, a big thing for her was let's get out of that environment. It was a big part of her plan for her life. She wanted to find a lovely man who was also Hispanic, who was not part of that world. And my dad came from the mountains, people who'd been in New Mexico forever and ever, and he just wasn't part of that world. And, and so she pulled us out of that world. When we would, we would be in that world, because it was our extended family, um, we would stick out. My mom would have our hair combed the same way and we'd be wearing these little suits and we really didn't fit, even though we were part of that part of that world. And I remember once one of my uncles asking me, Marty, what's the matter with you? You don't have a car. You don't have a girlfriend. And I took it really badly. Like something was broken about me. Something was wrong. And I remember sharing it with my mom afterwards and she lit up and then she went on a tear and she said, if Hispanics cared about education as much as we care about cars and girlfriends, 
we would be in a different place. It isn't all the Anglo's fault. Right. And so right. that's really how I mm. think about it. And generally, I just don't want to think or feel like a victim. I want to think or feel like there's something I could do. And the thing my mother showed me that we could do if we really wanted it was education. It's amazing, you know, in every study you see, Hispanics obviously work very, very hard. The Chavez family, for those of us who know members of your family, this is all about a work ethic. You know, uh, it's so much hard work, life is hard work. And yet you see that Hispanics in the United States, even though we work very hard, we have traditionally had a very difficult time amassing wealth and building fortunes. You know, it's systematic, you, you've touched on this before, but there's some folks who will say that systemic racism is to blame. Uh, others will say that it's a series of bad personal decisions that we're making that lead us astray. We don't know how to manage our money or it's not a priority to build, build wealth. What's holding us back in your opinion and preventing us from growing our wealth? Well, of course, systematic racism is to blame and it is not the only source as with most things. And uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a metaphor I, I heard the other day, I'm sure it's been out there forever, but I heard it for the first time, that, that elephants will be tied to a post as they're, they're little baby elephants. And then 10 years later, you don't even have to tie them to the post. Mm -hmm. They just stay there uh, because it's all they know. And they don't even explore the boundaries. And maybe that's a way to think of it that's in, that's in the middle, right? We, we right. grow up with the systemic oppression, all these forces telling us, nope, you can't do that. You can't build wealth. Wealth is for those other people. Right. And, and, and there's truth to it. And there are these forces and they're real. And, and then you also come to believe it. And even when the forces aren't always there, there's, they're still there in your mind. So I think that again is education, awareness, that the seeing that it can be done, that it's valuable, just knowing that and having those positive symbols and mentors and sponsors around you um, that can, you can get through an education. I think that's all part of what will be the breakthrough. Yes. So communication is central to my life. I know from my conversations with you, that you're, it's pretty important in your life as well. You have the ability to do something. I've noticed that a lot of people who start software companies as you did or who climb the ranks at Goldman Sachs can't do. You can tell a story. You can talk to normal people, to everyday people in everyday language, which is enormously valuable, right? Uh, there's a lot of people walking around with Stanford PhDs and Harvard BAs who can't do that. Uh, and you can do it. So I want to know where that comes from. You're able to speak in this clear language. Um, where did that come from? Where do you get that ability? Well... Um, I'd like to say that it's innate. <laughs> it is absolutely not. I had a spectacular English teacher in prep school. He, along with my mom and my professor of computer science at Harvard, really the main figures in my life. And this man was a legend and he ruthlessly beat out of us any kind of imprecise, sloppy speaking or writing, which he said was in every case, an external symptom of sloppy thinking. And so I remember once he asked me, he said, so young Martin, that's what he always called me. Is it true or is it sort of kind of more or less true? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he would use sort of kind of more or less all the time to make fun of any kind of sloppiness hedging, yeah. what have you. And he taught us to speak in complete sentences. And later on, I learned on and Silicon Valley and then on Wall Street, that the ability to explain something in standard language in clear sentences with the subject, verb and object, by the time I got there, it meant I really, truly deeply understood it. And I remember once when, when I became head of the engineering organization at Goldman Sachs, which was 10,000 people saying, I'm not the best mathematician here and I'm not right. the best software engineer and I'm not the best architect of, of software or math, but I speak in complete sentences and paragraphs and therefore I am your leader. And so right. it's turned out to be super valuable. That's, that's really good. That's those of us who are lucky enough to know at least one of the five children of Ray and Rose Chavez, either Marty, there's probably a thousand of us, right? 
thousands of us, either Marty, Rick, Tom, Andrea, or Elena, and I know three of the five, would probably all agree that all your collective brain power and hard work notwithstanding, sacrifices you made notwithstanding, the whole brood really hit the birth lottery when you were born into that family with those two parents. Can you share a story with us that sort of proves that point? Well, 1000%. My, my parents have uh, been with me uh, through the pandemic for the past almost half year. Um, and they just left this morning. And, mm. and as I, they, were, they were leaving, I was thinking, I'm just the luckiest person in the world to have been born to, to you too. Now, my mom uh, will say, she says this all the time. She said, I don't, I don't know how I got such smart kids um, because I'm not. And it's just false. I, I think if my mom had some education and been born in some different time, uh, she might be our ruler. You know, she just didn't have the, she just didn't have those, those opportunities. And so, look, I'm, I'm sure as with everything, it's, it's a mix, but I am a profound believer that the initial conditions matter hugely. And and, and the notion that's out there that you hear kind of a libertarian notion, oh, I did it all myself. I don't want to pay taxes. I think that's complete nonsense. Mm. And, and yes, there was hard work, but, but you know, there's, there's, there's lots and lots of hardworking people, of harder working people. And so I really don't think it's that. I, I think it was the constant daily intervention by my, by my parents. My, my mom made sure that when I went to kindergarten, I could read and write and add and subtract right. and multiply and things right. like that, I, I am sure, were, were what got started. And then I ran with it. And because I ran with it, my mother was inspired to, to do more. And then the teachers in my parochial school said, you know, your kid's really good at math. We really can't right. help them that much. You should send them to the local non-sectarian prep school. And then I got there and they said, your kid's really good at math. We can't help them. You should send them to the university when I was a, when I was a kid. And so it was the snowball process, but there's no question in my mind that without having won that privilege for which I did nothing to deserve it, um, yeah. of just being born to my mom and dad, without that, there would have been absolutely nothing. You tell a good story about how your mom stressed to you always the five of you, the importance of keeping your Spanish, maintaining your Spanish, right? And at the time you're sort of fighting her thinking, I'm gonna be a computer scientist. I don't need to know Spanish. And then years later, you're at Goldman Sachs and you get this great break because you know how to speak Spanish. Yeah. You know? And it, it, so mom's right again, right? Oh, and how annoying. <laughs> that happens, happens in my family, believe me, it happens in a lot of our families. Um, I wanna ask you about uh, something you mentioned that I should have mentioned before when I mentioned the five Chavezes your mom had also said she wanted to have 10 kids and have them all go to Harvard. And she gives herself a 50% because she had five kids, but they all went to Harvard. Yeah, 50% is an F. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For the Mexican Americans at Harvard, I can tell you firsthand, the, the Chavez is, uh, they really surpassed the Kennedys in terms of royalty. So uh, <laughs> your, your reputation precedes you all. Uh, one thing I know you've thought a lot about over the years is identity. Uh, you're an openly gay man, a New, York, a New Mexico native with Spaniard blood. You're a Jew who was raised with what you call, or how you call a mega Catholic. You describe a mega, mega Catholic. You're a Harvard graduate, a Stanford PhD, a computer scientist, and a global banker. You're also, though, a son, a brother, a father. And at those quiet moments when you're alone and you get lost in introspection, of which I think we've had a lot of chance to, to do introspection, engage in introspection over the last year or so, uh, what's your best answer to these questions? Who is Marty Chavez, uh, who were you growing up and, and for most of your life up to this point, who are you and how do you wanna be remembered? So I do love to look for unifying themes, right? So sometimes people say, well, you were, you were a banker and a computer scientist and did all these different things. And they politely say, well, that sounds really like, interesting, which might mean they think it's really confused or looks random or, <laughs> and, and, and to me, there is a unifying theme, which is solving interesting problems with math and software. I, I got into that when I was a kid, my first summer job in 
and Albuquerque, New Mexico is at the Air Force Weapons Lab. Uh, the government had decided to stop detonating neutron bombs in the Nevada desert and detonate the bombs in software simulation instead, where the destruction was only happening in simulation. And that idea is really, I've just been taking versions of that my whole life, doing it in Wall Street, doing it in life sciences, but it's the same concept, building mathematical worlds. So when you ask me about these other uh, roles that, that I've had or have, I look for what, what is the unifier across all of those. And so there is one word that really gets me going. I wake up every day and, 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 and think about it. And it's the possibility of transformation. Transformation for whatever reason is incredibly interesting to me, whether it's working on myself or working on a company or working on an industry or at an even broader uh, societal level. And when I think about the most uh, important version of that, the one that I experienced most intensely, it's of course like probably all of us with my, with my son and my daughter, right? That, mm -hmm. that having that transformational effect on them that my mom and dad had on me um, because taking what my mom and dad gave me and paying it forward uh, to my kids, but beyond them, um, that's, that's what gets me going. That's how I want to be remembered. We talked about the profound influence your mom had on you and on all five of you, uh, the Chavez brood, but also your father played a big role as <laughs> well. And you told me a great story. I heard you tell the story in various places. Uh, you often tell the story about what turned out to be a pivotal moment in your life. The year is 1976. You're 12 years old, okay? Uh, you've already blown away all the math that the public schools have to offer. They're, you're literally taking calculus at the University of New Mexico. Uh, and at 12, you're gonna be admitted to Harvard four years later at 16. Um, your dad pulls you aside in 1976. And it was like the scene right out of the movie, The Graduate, <laughs> you know, where, where instead of, you know, uh, somebody putting plastics. their- Plastics. <laughs> yeah, saying plastics. <laughs> Your dad puts his arms around you and says, Martin, the future computers, the future is computers. Okay. And that changed everything uh, oh, because people took that for granted, but 1976, not I mean, obvious. Come on, not <laughs> an obvious choice, not an obvious choice that changed everything. Four years later, you were accepted to Harvard. You decide to study computer science. And now you have two children of your own, Sebastian, who's six and Penelope, who's four, unless I missed a birthday. No, you're later. right. That's okay, it. good. One day when you're, when they're 12 years old, okay, you might pull them aside and you may tell them, mijo or mija, the future is what? Computers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. No, but even more so. Look, I would take, uh, is, <laughs> but I, seriously, um, I don't know if you've read, if you've read uh, the book Sapiens, and then Harari's mm -hmm. uh, follow-up book called Homo Deus, right? Okay. So Sapiens is modestly the history of humanity and Homo Deus is modestly the future of humanity. And, and so look, when my dad was talking about computers, he was thinking about coding, learning how to program. And, and that was a non-obvious thing. And that's been the core of everything for me. But now, now the computers are everywhere. What's, what's the next version of that? Well, in, in the book, which I really encourage you to read, it moved me profoundly and scared me. Uh, so, so he talks about a few things. And one of them is the rivalry, which is already upon us between the US and China. And the other one is what he calls the ascendancy of the digital priesthood. And he paints a rather dark vision of a very small number of people. He calls them the digital priesthood. Mm -hmm. And they are telling the computers what to do. They are designing the computers and designing how the computers interact with humanity and how the computers become the teachers of humanity. And that 
is an incredible obligation and it could go in all kinds of ways, right? And there's some pretty terrifying visions of AIs that are basically using human beings as, as um, you know, just manipulating them, telling them what to think. And so I'm doing what I can do to prepare my children for that future. And I think having people who can think and, and read and act, but have a whole mindset in multiple languages is crucial. Not just learning a language. Learning a language is wonderful, right? But I'm talking about thinking like people who grow up in that language because you are growing up in that language. So I'm putting everything I've got into raising my children to be natively trilingual, English, Spanish, Chinese, and switching. Like they can speak all three languages at the same time if you want them to. They look at an adult, figure out what that adult's base language is, and suddenly that's the language yeah. they're in. And, and for the digital priesthood, it's not coding. The computers are coding themselves now. Coding is a trade, it's great, it's been valuable for me, that's not the future. The future is what are we going to do with these computers and how are we going to contain them and guide them and shape them in ways that are consistent with ethics and values. I think that is an incredibly hard problem that brings together a lot more than just computers and computer science, but it's ethics and philosophy and government and political theory. And so is, is a I think my parents had a simple, simpler problem 30 years ago. Life seemed to go pretty slowly. And you yeah. could kind of imagine what the world would be like when your kids graduated from college. I simply can't imagine what the world right. will be like 15, 16 years from now when my kids graduate from college. So I'm getting them ready for all of it. I don't think that 20 years from now is going to look anything like today in any way we can predict. But those themes, the rivalry between the U.S. and China, and do we control the computers or do they control us? Mm -hmm. Those will be the themes then. You've said all along, you know, during this interview, this conversation, that you were lucky to have your parents. It's clear that Sebastian and Penelope are lucky to have you in their corner going forth. Marty Chavez, thank you so much for joining us. Folks, Good. Marty Chavez is a badass. First of all, you need to know that. Uh, <laughs> He is a former a CFO, a CIO at Goldman Sachs, former software engineer, developer, a computer scientist with a B, PhD from Stanford, a bachelor's degree from Harvard, master's degree from Harvard as well. Uh, and uh, he is now a senior advisor at Sixth Street Partners. I'm Ruben Navarrete. I contribute to Hispanic Executive Magazine. Uh, I, I'm a syndicate columnist of the Washington Post Writers Group, and I host the podcast Ruben in the Center. Thanks, Marty Chavez. So great to be with you today. Pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Be well, Ruben.